we're going to study uh, a passage that is found in Mark 5, verses 21 to 43. We actually looked at this some um, uh, for prayer meeting a few weeks ago, but we're going to spend a little more time on it today. But let's bow our heads for just a word of prayer, all right? Father, as we open up your word and as we study, we pray that you will draw us closer to yourself. Uh, may your Holy Spirit use these words, dear Lord, please. May he be present wherever we are uh, gathering together, both here in the building and in on the, on the internet uh, for worship. We pray that you'll be with each of us. Bless us, Lord, and bless these words in Jesus' name. Amen. The story that we're going to look at today is actually a story within a story. And it involved a marginalized part of Middle Eastern society. Society during Christ's time here on earth was a patriarchal society, meaning that it was dominated by men. Uh, there's a book that I have in my library that I've really enjoyed. Uh, it tells a lot about the life, uh, about the world that Christ lived in when he was here on earth. It's entitled Jerusalem in the Life and Times of Jesus. And it gives us a pretty clear picture of the place of women in the society of the time. It tells us, for instance, that women were forbidden to teach. In the house, a woman would be the last one considered to pronounce the benediction after a meal. Women were considered prone to lying. Now, the, that assessment was based on the story found in Genesis 18 about Sarah, where she overhears the Lord talking to Abraham about her having a son, and she laughs. And so the Lord calls her in and says, why did you laugh? And she said, well, I didn't laugh. And he said, yes, you did. Yes, you did. The story was used to justify the idea that because women were so prone to lying, that they shouldn't be permitted to give testimony in court. While there would have been great rejoicing at the birth of a son, it wasn't uncommon for there to be indifference or even sorrow at the birth of a daughter. A prayer that was recommended for daily use was the prayer, blessed be God that hath not made me a woman. The real value of a woman in the time of Christ was her ability to reproduce. And the author of the book, Joachim Jeremias makes it clear that it's only against the backdrop of the culture that you understand how radically different Christ's attitude towards women was. There were women that followed him, and that was almost unheard of in Jewish society. Jeremias says that Jesus not only was not only content with bringing women into a higher plain than was the custom, but as the savior of all, he brings them before God on equal footing with men. Knowing the cultural attitude towards women and girls is what makes our story stand out. And it begins in, Genesis, in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and, he will, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, we have to stop here and reflect on a few things. By this point in time, it is clear that the religious leaders of Israel are rejecting the message and the mission of Christ. In fact, they were actively searching for a way to catch him in his words so that they could condemn him. Desire of Ages tells us that Christ's willingness to go with Jairus surprised even the disciples. The truth of it was that Christ wanted to save even the religious leaders of Israel. It wasn't the reach of his mercy that was at fault, but the unwillingness of the spiritual elite to let go of their pride. But there's something about seeing your little girl at death's door that will humble even the most arrogant. And, you know, the closest I came, I raised two boys. The closest we came to daughters was two granddaughters. And I can remember when they would come over and stay with us. I think I told you I would kind of abandon the, you know, the, the, all the women got the master bedroom. I went and stayed in the guest room. But there was one time when my youngest granddaughter, Savannah, got quite sick. And uh, she was running a fever. We gave her children's Tylenol. And I had one of those 
thermometers like we're using out here that you point at their forehead and, and get the temperature and and it would light up. And she got mad at me in the middle of the night because I was in there every 15 minutes checking her temperature. And I finally, I remember stopping and praying. I said, Lord, I am not going to bed. I know we're supposed to get rest. You told us we need rest, uh, but I'm not going to bed until this girl's fever breaks. And uh, I'll stay up all night if I have to. I kind of figured, well, you know, God wants me to get good rest, but I'm saying, Lord, I'm not going to do it unless you break this, unless you make this fever break. And I stayed in there every few, every 15 minutes checking her temperature with that thing on her forehead until it finally broke and I could go to bed. That's the closest I come to understanding the emotions of Jairus. And as Jairus watched the life of his little sweetheart slipping away from him, he made up his mind that he would do anything to save her. His pride was no longer a factor in getting help. He would beg if necessary. So he finds Jesus and falls to his knees and begs. And I'm guessing that the relationship of this man to his daughter wasn't one of the ones that we spoke of earlier. This man doesn't appear to have been one of those who lamented the birth of his daughter. She apparently had daddy's heart square in the middle of her little hand. And the thought of losing her was more terrifying to him than anything else. Mark is quite graphic in his description of this man appearing before Christ. Mark says that he fell to the ground on his knees and begged him earnestly. As Christ sets out for Jairus's house, they are thronged by a crowd of people. The going was painfully slow. And Jairus, I am sure, was almost overwhelmed by anxiety. And that is when the story within the story takes place. As Jesus was slowly making his way to the home of Jairus, unknown to the crowd, Another suffering individual is trying to reach him. Mark 5 verse 25 says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. For 12 years, this woman had endured the shame of being perpetually unclean. What the medical problem wasn't clear, but the issue of blood made her unclean, and she wasn't supposed to be around other people. For 12 years, she had been seeking an answer. Her wealth had been spent on first one remedy, and then a number, another, one hope after another would be dashed, and it seemed like there would be no relief from this disease. And then she began to hear of the miracles of Jesus. He had healed the deaf. He had restored sight to the blind. Those paralyzed by disease had been made to leap and dance. Even the lepers were cleansed, and the dead were raised to life. Couldn't he who did such things heal her? The only problem was she was unclean. To tell him openly what her problem was, was to open herself to public ridicule and perhaps to rejection. But it was her only chance. When she finally got to where Jesus was, the crowd was so huge as to make it impossible to reach him. As the Lord set out for the home of Jairus, she followed, hoping against hope that she might get near him. It became clear that talking to him was out of the question. But the thought began to rest on her that if she could just touch the edge of his robe, she would be healed. It was some time before she could get near. People were pressing on him from every side. She kept working her way through the crowd, squeezing through here, pressing through there. And suddenly, as the crowd shifted, she was within reach. You know, I suspect that she might have even been knocked to the ground by the crowd. The Bible tells us that she reached up and touched just the hem of his garment, the hem down at the bottom of the robe. And as the crowd moved along, she knew in that instant that she had been healed. But the strangest thing happened next. She was trying quietly to exit the crowd, but Jesus stopped the whole procession and asked the most absurd question. Verse 30 says, and Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? 
But his disciples said to him, you, you see the multitude thronging you. And you say, who touched me? Jesus was being pressed and jostled on every side. People were pressing all around him to get a closer look at this great healer. And yet he knew the touch of faith. Verse 32, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And I want you to listen carefully to the words of Jesus' response to this woman. Verse 34, and he said to her, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. He didn't say woman like he did elsewhere. He didn't say, hey, you've been made well. Go on your way. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. One time the disciple Philip once asked Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? The Heavenly Father in Christ was declaring to this woman, You're my daughter. You're my daughter. There was another reason why Christ stopped the crowd that day, too. He was not willing to let the idea be given that somehow touching his robe had made some miraculous thing happen, that there was some miraculous nature to his clothes. Through the centuries of Christianity, there have been all kinds of supposedly holy relics that, some, that have had supposedly some miraculous power. It was important that it be understood that the power wasn't in the robe, but was in the faith. It was the exercise of faith that brought about the healing. Christ would give no opportunity for superstition to claim that there was healing virtue for the mere act of touching his clothes. It was not through the outward contact with him, but through the faith which took hold of his divine power. It was through that faith that the cure was wrought. But there's still another story going on. Do you remember? Verse 35. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer? I'm sure that there were no words that ever pierced Jairus's heart like those words, your daughter is dead. The torment in his heart. Why were we delayed? Why did he have to stop and heal so many people? Couldn't they have waited until my daughter was healed? He was probably just about to turn to Christ and say, it's too late. We waited too long. And now she's gone. But Jesus knew what was happening. Verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. Only believe. Sometimes it's in the worst possible situations that we learn faith. Sometimes when we cannot learn things, when things are peaceful, we have to learn them in the midst of the storm. It was in the face of death that Jesus looked Jairus in the eyes and said, don't be afraid, just believe. You know, I believe that those words still have power today. Jesus knew what he was going to do. Verse 37, and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. These were the paid wailers. It was customary to hire the professionals to let everyone know just how much you were grieving. Verse 39, when he came in, he said to them, why, does this, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when, he put them all out, but when he put them all outside, he took the father and mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. The Zyre of Ages tells us that the crowd was indignant at the words of Jesus. They had seen the child die. And they laughed at him. It's interesting to see how easy it is for these paid mourners to shift from mourning to laughing. I also find it interesting 
that Jesus would describe the little girl as sleeping. Just as a reminder, the Bible describes death as a sleep, doesn't it? In fact, if this little girl was now in heaven, it would have been quite a disappointment for her to at one moment be in glory and then at the next moment to be back in this dreary old world of ours. Daniel 12 verse 2 says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. It's an Old Testament concept. First Thessalonians 4 verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Death has always been described in the Bible as a sleep. This little girl was sleeping in the embrace of death. And if Jesus hadn't intervened, she would have waited until the morning of the resurrection. But she was asleep. Telling the crowd to leave, Jesus took with him the father and the mother of the little girl and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John. And together they entered the chamber of death. Verse 41, then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. Jesus spoke to her in the language that she was familiar with, Aramaic. And then, verse 42, immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. This was a day that this family was never going to forget. To be broken by grief in one moment and to be filled with rejoicing in the next was something that they would never, ever stop talking about. I find it interesting that all three of the Gospels tell the same story, one story embedded in another. And I've spent a lot of time trying to understand why this story would be presented the way it was, these two stories. It's interesting to note that there are similarities in both of these stories. The number 12 is a part of both. The little girl was 12 years old and the woman with the issue of blood had suffered for 12 years. It finally dawned on me that this is the story of the two daughters. It starts with the story of Jairus' daughter and a father's desperate efforts to save her life. And in the middle of that story comes a second story about another daughter, a woman who is losing hope, who has spent everything she had trying to find healing and is about to give up. She reaches out to Christ in one last Ditch, ditch effort and in response he says to her daughter your faith has made you well go in peace and be healed of your affliction the picture I see here is of one father desperate to save his daughter's life and a heavenly father just as desperate to save all of his daughters you know ladies we live in a world that has a history of marginalizing women. Women have been treated as objects and sometimes as property. They have been used and abused and many are still treated as if they have no value out of, outside of meeting someone else's needs. Maybe you carry in your heart today the scars and the wounds of those who have, should have loved you for who you are and they didn't. Jairus was desperate to save his daughter. You need to know that Christ is even more desperate to save his daughters. Maybe the wounds are still fresh. Perhaps they're still bleeding. He says to you today, daughter, it is for you that I gave my own blood. It is for you that I surrendered my life. Reach out to me in faith and I will heal your wounds. Someday, Jesus is going to come to take us home. And some of the scars and the wounds we bear, Jesus will have to take from us when he sees us for that first time coming in the clouds. But I promise you that if you cling to him in faith, you will hear the words, daughter, your faith has made you well. Be at peace. Enter the home that I have prepared for you. 
You know, it's the Apostle John who in utter amazement says in 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And yes, gentlemen, that includes us too. You know, a friend of mine, Dr. Bill Knott, has for some time been writing and sending out little publications called Grace Notes. Um, here's one that he sent me last week. And this is what it says. Who do you think you are? The bully thundered. And we shrank back into some smaller self that could more easily escape or hide. Who do you think you are? The college entrance essay asked. And we explained that we were the product of suburban schools or immigrants or persons trying on new cultures. I am a daughter, an orphan, a member of a racially exploited group. Who do you think you are? The counselor gently queried us. And we described our brokenness, our loss of self, our pain to someone who we paid to listen to our stories. Who do you think you are? The father asks. And how he smiles when we respond with joy and laughter shining in our eyes. I am the prodigal son. Come home. I am the son or a daughter of your love. I am the one you never take your eyes off, even when I played the rogue or spent your wealth or claimed I never knew you. I am the child you pledged to always love. And even when I get it wrong, I feel your grace, your kindness, your forgiveness. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 5, 8 through 9. You cannot earn the Father's love. You cannot lose the Father's love. So stay in grace. Bill not. And my message to you today is, children of God, go in peace. Your heavenly Father loves you. Father in heaven, I bring everyone who is hearing this message today, everybody who is with us, either here in the building or online. And I pray for all of these people, my family, those who belong to me by faith that are in my, in my heart and in yours especially. I pray that you will fill them with just a, a special sense of being valued and loved by you. Your love reaches beyond anything any of us can ever understand. Your patience and your mercy is, is something that we can't comprehend. How you could be so patient with us despite our failures and our mistakes. So, Father, help us to remember who we are. Your children, your sons and daughters. Help us to sense the value you have placed on us. Help us to know that in your sight, we are more precious than anything else. Give us your grace and help us to live life in the knowledge of your infinite love. In Jesus' name, amen.